Early this year, I read an old story. I'd never read it before. You may have read it. It was talking about the Battle of the Bulge. It took place in December 1944. And I, I read the story of how our Allied troops were marching successfully over the enemy and moving on and moving on. And suddenly they noticed uh, in, in the lines what they thought was a bulge, where the enemy soldiers began to experience some success against our Allied troops during the Second World War. And they were succeeding. And they didn't know what was happening. They, learned, they later learned, after they had uh, found the problem and corrected it, that their success was due to the ingenuity on the part of a German general who got some German soldiers and dressed them in American uniforms, flew them over the Allied lines, and then he also got some American jeeps that they had captured and somehow got them back behind the Allied lines. And they had no weapons, not a single gun, not a hand grenade, no pistol, no nothing. Their sole job was to go through the countryside and change the sign. If the sign pointed so many kilometers one direction, change it to another direction. Or if a sign said one thing, change it to read something else. And what had happened was, when the Allied troops would send for reinforcements, they sent reinforcements, but they never arrived because somebody had gone through the countryside and changed all the signs. And I've been thinking lately, in the religious world, even in the fundamental world, and I hope you're listening to me, I think if we're not careful, we'll run the risk of going the wrong direction because somebody's changed the sign on us. And the signs are constantly being changed. Now, words don't mean what they used to mean. And don't leave me, and don't get mad. If you disagree, at least give me the courtesy of listening to me. The first sign I notice being changed is a sign of salvation. The Bible is so clear on how to be saved. The jailer said to the apostle Paul, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And Paul answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. In John chapter 3, when Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Be born? Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. You're talking about a physical birth, he said. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. You want to know how? All right, Nicodemus, you know the Old Testament story of the people being bit by the serpents. You know how Moses was instructed to raise a brazen serpent, and every person that looked at it lived. All right, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Just like that, even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. I'm going to die on a cross. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the simple salvation sermon. An old preacher addressed a big congregation of younger preachers, and before he left, someone stood and said, Before you leave, give us one final word of advice. He wept and said, My preacher brothers, make it plain to men how they are to be saved. We preach on the Great Commission an awful lot, especially in the missions conferences, but there's one thing I never hear emphasized when people preach on the Great Commission, and that's the word gospel. He didn't say go into all the world and preach baptizing men in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But he gave them the specific message they were to deliver when they preached to people. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If that is true, and the Great Commission is given five times in the New Testament, then the most important message anybody can deliver anywhere in the world is the gospel message. When I started a church in Atlanta, Georgia, I had some preachers say to me, you need not try to build a church here. People are gospel-hardened. There's so many churches in Atlanta, they've heard the gospel so much, they are turned off, they're gospel-hardened. But after being in Atlanta for more than 20 years, I discovered the people in Atlanta were not gospel-hardened. Sad to say, but they were gospel-ignorant. A lot of folk wouldn't know the gospel if they met them in the middle of the road. They preach everything in the world and say, that's the gospel. I've even heard folks say, that's the gospel truth. That's the gospel truth. It may be the truth, but it may not be the gospel truth. When I preach on hell, I preach the truth, but I don't preach the gospel. I create a necessity for the gospel, but I don't preach the gospel. When I preach on judgment, I preach the truth and a solid Bible truth, but I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm creating a necessity for the gospel. When I preach on heaven, I preach a blessed truth. 
that I'm not preaching the gospel, I create a necessity for the gospel. And when I finish my sermon on hell or judgment or heaven or second coming, I may have created a desire in a man's heart to be saved lest he go to hell or lest he face God in judgment. But unless I preach the gospel, I haven't yet told that man how to be saved. I may have told him why he ought to be saved. I tell you the honest truth tonight, I, I wouldn't lie to you for anything in the world. If I had the whole world before me with one message to give, I'd give the simplest gospel sermon I could possibly give and make it clear to me how to be saved. I watch men buy television time and spend millions and millions of dollars of television time. And they're experts at almost saying something. I sat in front of the television set and I said, he's about to say it. And I believe he's going to tell them how. And he gets that close. And I, I'm standing there sweating in my living room and my den. I'm, I said, please, he's close to it. Come on, tell him. And he stops that short and runs off somewhere and never tells the guy how to be saved. I'm Baptist, Baptist born and Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I'm Baptist. And a rooster won't crow in his own barn. You ought to wring his neck and make chicken and dumplings out of him. I'm Baptist. And I was a president of Baptist University of America, and I know what Baptist doctrinal statements look like, and I know what a statement of faith is. But the sad thing in many Baptist churches is we've copied somebody else's doctrinal statement. And he copied somebody else's doctrine and said, he don't know what his copy means because he copied somebody else. And we got a lot of things, sometimes our statements we don't really mean. We wouldn't believe it. We're pushed to the wall about it. For instance, that statement, we believe in the, in the perseverance of the saints. We put that in our statement. But we don't really believe that because I've heard you preach. We don't endure to the end. We don't persevere to the end, and therefore we're saved forever because we finally endure and make it. No, we're, we don't persevere. We are preserved. Now, some of you look like you've been pickled, but you're really preserved. Why don't we use Bible terminology rather than John Calvin's terminology? Wouldn't that be better? I don't believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe in the preservation of the saints. They're signed, sealed, and will be delivered. Saved forever. Yeah. I didn't mean to get that in. That just came in. I told you it's a new sermon. I'm making it up as I go. The new, I'm going to make some notes on it myself, so give me time. But you go home and read your Baptist doctrine of the statement say, We believe in salvation by grace through faith. That's what it says. And yet, we think if we don't make it real hard for people to get saved, they're not really saved. And we'll make it real, real hard for them to get saved. Then they really, really are saved. Then. That's about as dumb as anything I've ever heard in my life. I don't know the difference between being saved and really saved. I never have figured the difference out. That's like going to the funeral home and saying, that and that casket is dead over there. He's dead. Just dead, that's all. But glory to God, this one over here, he's really dead. He's really dead. He's and this one over here, he has an old-fashioned sky-blue heaven dose of death. Glory to God, maggots working in his eyeballs. Hallelujah. He's got it. Now, they all fear in the same shape. They're just dead. My old preacher kept me as confused as a termite in a yo-yo trying to preach the gospel to me. Somebody gets saved in the church and whoo, and shout them down out. he say, boy, he's really saved. He, he really got a dose of old time. Glory to God. He's got it. And, he'd, and everybody would shout. And as a little boy, I thought, well... I didn't get it. And I, I didn't get really saved because I didn't run them down the aisle and shout like that guy did, so I'm not really saved. But I learned after 21 years passing the same church, you can't tell my how much gas in the tank with the honk of the horn. I know a lot of Baptists still blowing the horn, been out of gas for years and years and years. We've confused the sign of salvation so the average person, if they want to be saved, don't know how to be saved. Now, don't get mad at me. Because this one point's going to take a whole sermon here. Yeah. Say and really say, no, you're just saved. And the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved, or, John, or Acts 16, 31 is a lie. You say, what if I didn't feel like it? I, a lot of days I don't feel like it. Some days it's noon before I begin to feel like I'm saved. But feelings go and feelings come and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the Word of God and all else is worth believing. So I'll trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For though all earth should pass away, his word abides forever. See? I feel good, but I don't know I'm saved because I feel good. I know I'm saved because the Bible says so, and I feel good because I know I'm saved. Don't you see that? 
I preached in churches and, pe- and told people how to get saved. And I asked you, oh, trust the Lord, come shake the preacher's hand. They come down the aisle and trust the Lord and tell the preacher, I'm trusting Jesus. And then somebody take them off of you and talk them out of it. And bring it back a card, wrote rededication on the card. I get so nervous, I don't know what to do. And you say, well, what about all these false professions? What about them? Where are they? I don't know any. You're getting awful quiet here tonight. If you come to me and told me my profession was false, I'd slap your jaws in Christian love. I know I wasn't lying to God when I told him I was trusting him. Why should I call a man who walks down an aisle a liar when he tells me he's trusting Jesus? I say, you lying about it? Is this false? That's about the dumbest thing I heard of in a long time, man. Talk to him. What about all those little old kids? What about them? They trust Jesus, they're saved. Well, where are all of them? Well, where are the 100,000 members in Acts chapter 6 when you get to Acts chapter 12? They're scattered abroad. They're everywhere. That's where they are. I got them scattered all over the world. Got some in jail. Don't look surprised. You have too. You got some in jail. Not all of them are good. You're getting quiet on me. I'm going to have a good time. Are you doing not? I'm probably going to hit you in a minute, so don't get too mad. They say if you don't make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you're not saved. You didn't get that in the Bible. You're getting quiet now, aren't you? Yeah. Was he Lord of David's life when he committed adultery with Bathsheba? No, he wasn't. Was David saved? Yeah, a man off to God's own heart. Come on. The guys who tell you to quit your sinning and God will save you hadn't quit their sinning yet. How many of you quit your sinning? You never have sinned since you've been saved. Raise your hand. I want to see the pen feathers on your back. If you hadn't sinned since you've been saved, raise your hand if you're in here. I want to see you, dirty liar, you. Sure you sinned since you've been saved. Come on. How many think you might have sinned today sometime? Raise your hand real high and let's see how many sinners we got here. Yeah, I got a bunch of them. How many told a lie since you've been saved? Raise your hand. Don't lie about it again. Come on, get them up, all you liars. Keep them up. Keep them up. You've lied since you've been saved. Raise your hand. You know what you are? You're a liar. Keep your hand up. Keep it up, all you liars. And look around because those that don't have their hands up, biggest lies in the whole state of Texas. If getting saved is getting on your knees and promising Jesus you'll never sin again, I wouldn't get saved because I wouldn't lie about it. I'll promise I'll do the best I can, but my best ain't going to be good enough. If my best was good enough, he didn't need to go to Calvary 2,000 years ago and die for my sin. Don't leave me now. If confessing Jesus as Lord makes a man saved, then you've got to preach universal salvation. Because Jesus is coming back someday, and the Bible said every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then you've got universal salvation. You're getting awful quiet in here, don't you believe the Bible? Why don't you just take it like it is? Salvation wasn't by grace and a gift. Nobody go to heaven. But we change the sign, and you know, and we apologize about preaching like this because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody who thinks you must keep the Ten Commandments to get saved. You're getting quiet. And up where I live, the Camelites, God bless you, you got them down here too, and you need a blessing with them folks around. They preach a lie and saying the truth. I never heard anything like them. Up there where you are, they got a class called Amazing Grace Bible. Class is the myth, biggest myth no one ever heard in my life. I watched them on television the other day. They were singing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I, I screamed, You lying devil. What do you mean? You're singing, Your hope's built on nothing less than time they don't get baptized, they're not saved. Your hope's built on the baptistry. If that water washed your sins away, I wouldn't let you baptize me up there. Not after you baptized about 20 others in front of me, I'd come out and worse shape than I went in in. Come out more sin on my head when I went in the place. I wouldn't even want the preacher to baptize me lest his sins get washed off in there with me. I'd want the bab- baptistry sterilized and boiled and perfumed before I went in it. If they believed the water washed their sins away, they'd quit building churches and get a water hose. Come on, man. They ought to sing that song the sons of the pioneers sang. Water, water, keep a moving, Dan. Don't you listen to him, Dan. He's a devil, not a man. And he treads the burning sand with water, water, water. That's what they ought to sing instead of amazing grace. Woo! Ain't we having a good time here? But everybody comes along and changes the sign on salvation. Why don't we leave it like it says? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. Why don't we leave it like that? When a man says, I do, I wonder if he's really married. When he says, I do, if I'm performing the ceremony, it's done. And I don't say, did you really mean it? Are you sincere? Is this a false profession you're making here? Or if I picked you green, 
Come on. I, he says, I do. I said, it's done. Go get out of here now. Did they live it? I don't know anybody ever got married and lived it. My wife's sitting back there. She'll tell you I don't live it. So I'm going to tell you, oh, she does. And I'm going to tell her she don't live it either. I never have known anybody live it. Everybody expected more of his wife than he got. And that was awful quiet because your wife's sitting next to you, you dirty coward. But don't get mad because uh, every husband, wife's expecting more of her husband you ever got to. Somebody said, was it a happy marriage? I said, oh, yeah, the marriage was very happy. It's the living together that's tough. Easy to get married hard to live the married life. Do your wife, your wife have a fuss? I word fine so fast they don't have time to get crossed up. I never have, I never have wanted to divorce her, but I wanted to kill her three or four times. And tried to punt her 40 yards one time, but she wouldn't go. Only kidding, I got better sense than that. I'm, just, I'm making a point. I'm exaggerating to make a point. We don't ever exaggerate. We crowd buckets of tears over our exaggeration. To get that by midnight delivery tomorrow. When a man gets married, he says, I do. I never said, you mean that? Are you serious about that? Is this a false profession or real? When a sinner comes out of the house and tells me he's trusting Jesus, Savior, I take him at his word and take God at his word and say the guy's everlasting life because God said so and that said it. He's going to heaven. He may not behave all the time, but he's going to heaven. But we come along changing the salvation sign all the time. Won't add this to it and that to it and the other to it. And if you ever sinned since you got saved and blessed God, you need to go back and check your salvation. That's dumb. That's dumb. What you need to do is ask the Lord to forgive you. Confess your sin based on 1 John 1, 9. Get forgiveness and cleansing. Get fellowship with God going about your business. All my kids are my kids the day they were born. That's one thing about birth. It's final. If you believe in the new birth, the new birth's also final. I don't see how, I don't see how these folks get on the television and preach on the new birth and tell you you can lose it. How many babies you ever had born in your house you lost? You can't undo birth. I don't care if he comes out cross-eyed, snaggle tooth, and you want to disown him, he's still yours. It's final, and he belongs to you and your wife. Hey, your blood's in his body. Yeah. I'm worried because we keep changing the salvation time. We're afraid if we, if we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody may say, well, that's easy believism. Well, you know what, so? I don't know what hard believism is. If you'll describe hard believism, I might understand what easy believism is. Ninety-nine times in the Gospel of John it says, believe, 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 believe. Not one time say, behave, 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 say, believe. I'm telling you what the sign says. If you want to change the sign, you change it, read what you want. I'm telling you what the sign says. Salvation's a gift. I've heard men get up over a dead body and say, now, Joe's gone unto his reward. And I nudged somebody. I said, no, he's not going to his reward. He's going to heaven. Heaven's not a reward. Heaven's a gift. he get his reward at the judgment seat of Christ. He's gone to heaven now. It's getting kind of quiet on me. Don't leave me. Yeah. I believe you ought to make Jesus Lord of your life and surrender to Christ and do right and be a good spirit-filled Christian. But you don't do that stuff to get saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. And you live right because you are saved. If you don't live right, God will chastise you. Don't confess your sins. You get forgiveness and cleansing. That's clear as a bell in the Bible. But i got some more signs I want to talk about. But I like this sign. Because I think if there's ever been a need in America, it's a need that preachers go to the pulpit and preach the gospel for a king. Clear as a bell and tell folks how to get saved. I know when I go to churches, people are hungry to get saved. I'm not bragging. We had 684 saved in one service this year. The next Sunday had 120 something saved in one single service. Not bragging. But most people are like the fellow, you believe you told about him just now. Didn't nobody ever told me that before. If you check that guy, he's been to church hundreds of times in his life, but nobody ever told him that before. You know, there's a lot of folks in your neighborhood, nobody ever told them how to get saved. They never just took the Bible. Did you know I went to church all my life and my preacher never told me how to be saved? You don't know, ought to be. Told him I wasn't. I was going to hell, but he never told me how to be. And if I wanted to be saved, I wouldn't know how. Let's not apologize for the simplicity of the gospel. Let's just tell it like it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
that whosoever believeth on him and gets baptized and keeps the Ten Commandments and don't sin, makes Jesus Lord of his life, shall not perish ever last night. Why do we want to have all that stuff in it? Why don't we just leave John 3.16 like John 3.16? You can't improve on John 3.16. I still love it. Glory to God, I'm about to shout thinking about it. I've heard about a little boy over in London. A little raggedy boy. Didn't have a place to sleep at night. And the fellow said, you go down to a certain place at the front door and just say John 3.16. That's all you do. He didn't know what John 3.16 was. He'd never heard it. Never seen the Bible. It was a mission he went to. He knocked on the door, a man came out, he said, John 3, 16, he said, come in, son. He took him to the bathroom, ran a tub full of hot water, gave him a big bar of soap and some wash balls, and said, get a bath and clean up. He got out of there and he felt so good with his new bath, he said, John 3, 16. Don't know what it means, but it sure makes a dirty boy clean. And he took him into the dining hall and sat and put a big hot bowl of soup in front of him, some bread and butter, and jam, a big glass of milk. He ate till he couldn't eat no more. The man walked away and he rubbed his little mouth off the thumbs from it and said, John 3, 16. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it sure makes the hunger boy full. He took him and put him on a bed with clean sheets on it. This boy went to sleep. He looked up to the ceiling and said, John 3.16. I don't know what it is. But it sure makes the dirty boy clean, makes the hungry boy full, and sure makes a tired boy rescue. Yeah. Well, I know what it means. I mean, it means God loved me and you so much that he took our sins and put them on Jesus 2,000 years ago and punished Jesus in our place to pay the debt we owe and tell us we'll just believe on him. we have everlasting life. And I'm going to stick with it. Now, you can change if you want to, but I'm going to stick with it. We could have a revival. We start preaching salvation by grace through faith again, like the Bible says. I've won thousands of people to Christ that never joined my church. Were they really saved? Yep, they were saved. We don't have any unreally ones. All of them are really ones. People ask dumb questions, don't they? Like a guy building a new building. The fellow said, well, I see you putting up a new building, aren't you? Well, they said, yeah, we don't put up any old ones. We just put up new ones. Well, hallelujah, amen, glory to God. Now the sign we're changing, the sign of separation. I thank God I read my Bible for some of these folks that coined the expression legalism came along. Now then, if you, you know, if you believe in living clean, you're a legalist. A legalist in some man's eyes is somebody's more separate than he is. It's, it's sad because I see educated people, I mean college professors, calling separation legalism. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Legalism is teaching you must keep the law in order to get saved. It has nothing to do with separation. Seventh-day Adventists are legalists. Come on. Separation has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with a man and how a man lives to get saved. You're not a legalist because you say you ought not to get drunk and kill anybody. It'll make you a legalist. But if you say to a guy that don't get drunk, don't kill anybody, and you can go to heaven, now that's legalism. That's teaching works for salvation. Don't leave me. And now, you know, we're afraid to, to preach folks ought to live right anymore. We're afraid we'll get branded a legalist. Well, I've been here. We've changed the separation sign to legalism. Let's take the legalism label off. Let's don't let people change that sign. The queers have ruined the good word. You all be quiet in here. One of those guys died out in California. They cremated him, sent his ashes home in the fruit jar. They have stole the word gay from my vocabulary. You can't even say gay anymore. You say, well, he's, he, the kid looks so gay. Oh, I don't mean that. You can't even use a good word anymore. They've ruined it. Next time a guy says to you, so-and-so is a legalist, say, now, you're lying about that, or you're dumb one or the other. Or you've slept too long on one side, and your brain's tumbled out your ear. Something happened to you. Dr. Hiles wears his hair shorter than I wear mine. But he's 
not legalists. Their hair, Krishna's wear their hair short on Dr. Howe's. But they're not legalists. I know a bald-headed modernist who believes doesn't believe in the virgin birth. It looks like his neck's blowing a bubble. He don't have a hair at all. Why don't we name legalism? What, leave legalism sign alone. Legalism is teaching, keeping the law to get saved, or, keeping, or doing works to get saved, or getting baptized to get saved, teaching anything contrary to salvation by grace through faith. Some of these guys who call separation legalism are legalists themselves and say, if you don't do this, that, and other, you're not saved. I'm having a good time. I don't know where you are now, but I'm having a good time. And no one of the world's so confused. Especially young folks coming along had read the Bible very much. They hear so much. They, then they tend to say, well, he is who's right. He, it's not who's right. It's, it's this book. Is it right? If the book's right, stay with the book. Don't stay with the who. Stay with the book. When they gathered at the empty tomb of Jesus, they didn't gather together with somebody. Their common love for Jesus brought them together at the empty tomb. It wasn't a planned meeting. It wasn't scheduled. They just happened to show up together. You know why you're here tonight in this building? You you kind of believe in the same things I do. You wouldn't be here. Or else you come out of curiosity. And we're tanning your hide right now. I enjoy the music. David Parrish. You did music. I like the choir. I like a little pop pop in the music. I like a little I don't like everything dead. You got quiet then, didn't you? Did you know the devil don't have any music? There'll be no music in hell. The devil stole music from God and prostituted it. Did you know music is the only language you can't say an unkind word then? Try to sing an unkind word or try to say something against somebody mean in music. You can't do it. Never been a song written that said unkind things. It's the only language you can't be unkind in. Talk to me. You never thought about that before, had you? I hadn't either just then. Better make a note of that. That's good. I like that. The sign of salvation is being changed from salvation by grace through faith. The salvation plus making Jesus Lord. The salvation plus quitting all your sins. I'm for quitting all the sin you can quit. I'm for living as right as you know how to live. And I don't think anybody tries to live any righter than I do. There's a lot of things I've never done. I never smoked a cigarette in my life. I don't know what it tastes like. Never had a drop of beer in my mouth in my heart. I don't know what it tastes like. Never had a drop of whiskey in my mouth in my heart. I don't know what it tastes like. Strongest thing I've been in my mouth, I got it in the Primitive Baptist Church. Homemade wine by a deacon at the Lord's Supper. Don't get mad at me, but that's where I got it. Burned my tongue off. I said, Lord of mercy, what are they putting in this juice? It's the hottest stuff I've ever had in my mouth. Only time I've wanted to spit in the church. Unless you think I've been perfect, I did have one chew of Brown's mule about it. Friend of mine had a big old pug that big, and he took it out, took a bite, coming to walking home from Reed and school. He said, "You want some of this?" I said, "Is it good?" He said, "Good, man, it's good." If I thought if it's good, I'm going to get all I can get. So I opened my mouth the big I get it, took a bigger bite as I get I almost took the whole bug. And it was good. I'm not lying. It was good. It had a sweet taste. My salivary glands worked with the working overtime. In a minute, my mouth's full of juice, and I did what I do with all sweet juice. I get in my mouth, I swallowed it. I swallowed four or five times, and then I began to veer off to the right. I couldn't go left. And I looked over at him. I said, come get me. I can't come back. He laughed and let me just go. I just kept going to right. I lost my left landing gear. I just kept going right. Finally, I couldn't stand up. I fell down. And when I fell down, the world turned upside down. And I held on to clumps of grass with my hands. And please, I said, please, God, don't let me fall off the world. If you don't let me fall off the world till it gets back up right, I never will chew no more brown new long as I live. And I never did. But beech nut, that's a different story. No, that's all I ever had, that one big bite of brown mule. Like to kill me, that old mule kicks. 
Somebody say, can you chew tobacco and go to heaven? Yeah, but you have to go to hell's pit. Won't be no spit tunes up there. Why are we having a good time? This is a sword conference, isn't it? Well, this sword I'm preaching right here. This is a sword. The sound of salvation has been changed. The sound of separation has been changed. Maybe some of you don't practice as much personal separation as somebody else does, but you're wrong to criticize the other guy. If the guy's going overboard, I'd rather see him go overboard in the favor of right than the favor of wrong. Some I remember when 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 the bell bottom trousers came out. You remember there's a period there where the, where they, you remember when the pants legs were all so narrow you couldn't get your foot through it. You had to take your shoes off and get your britches on. You remember that? Look, I see some. They tack a little old thing. I have a thing. You make your feet look that long. And finally, they came back to the stove pipe britches. And I was so glad to get some big legged britches. And I bought the first ones that came out. And the guy got to preaching. He gets my bell bottom trousers. His modernism had on bell bottom trousers. Said, Lord have mercy. You got to wear them pistol legged britches to be a fundamentalist. I thought that's the weirdest thing. Colored shirts came out. And somebody said to Dr. Ryan, Dr. Ryan said, You think that's worthy wearing that red shirt? Dr. Ryan said to me, He would really have a fit if he could see my underwear. <laughs> you got some kind of underwear on too back there? <laughs> salvation sign, the separation sign. Let's keep preaching salvation by grace through faith. No, that, let's, don't people, let's don't let people muddy that up. And intimidate us by, by saying you're preaching needs to believe this. And I'm going to preach believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I should be saved. And you can make fun of it if you want to. And you can question my converts if you want to. But I know everybody that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved because God don't lie. And if you're more separated than I am, I'm not going to fuss at you. you know? Yeah. If I'm more separated than you are, don't fuss at me. I have to wear my hair short in places. That I wear long, I place it. If you ball in the front, you'll thank. If you ball in the back, you'll love her. If you ball in the front and back, you thank you'll love her. I don't know if that's true or not. That's an old one. I shouldn't have given you that. Hallelujah. Then there's another sign being changed. A soul winning sign being changed. Did you know I hear fundamental independent preachers say, well, you don't build churches now by soul winning. That preacher's right to change the Bible because it's 1986. When the Great Commission was given, it said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. It didn't say, Go to church and preach to those that show up. It said, Go into the world and preach to them out there. And baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's pretty plain, isn't it? And that Great Commission closes by saying, Even unto the end, the world. How long is it supposed to go on? 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, till Jesus comes back. You keep doing the same thing they did in the book of Acts. Daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. We think we're smarter than God now, though. We say, well, it's, that was okay, God, back then, but it's 1986. Yeah, but God's the same. The Bible's the same. Sinners are the same. The plan of salvation the same. Holy Spirit's the same. Need's the same. If we get saved the same way. Brother Randy Ray said to me earlier, we need to get back this workhorse soul winning. Which he meant just practical soul winning. Just telling folks how to get saved. He told me, he told me about somebody, I believe you won the crowd the other day. Across the street from where he lived, where the church is located. He said, I thought, I, need, I just need to go tell him how to get saved. Been there for several years. I went and opened the Bible, so how to get saved, man, got saved. You hear expressions like this. If you read evangelical magazines, you read expressions like this. We believe in making disciples, not in getting decisions. How can you make disciples without getting decisions unless you steal somebody else's decisions? Who, who are you going to make disciples out of unless you get some decisions? Don't leave me. And, you don't, and they say you don't confront people anymore with the gospel. They talk about lifestyle evangelism as opposed to confrontational evangelism. Did you know the Bible knows one kind of evangelism? Confrontational evangelism. 
Did you know John the Baptist was a witness? Don't go to sleep. John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. He was not the light, but came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. How did he witness? With his lifestyle? Walking around town, grinning like a possum? With honey and grasshoppers hanging out of his beard and the leather girt alone? How many folks would say, John, you got something I ain't got. Tell me how to get saved. They had to put a white jacket on him holding with the insane asylum. But now then, you know, they say, well, don't confront people with it. Just, just live it before them. I pastored the church for 21 years. We had people say and baptize every service I was there, every Sunday I was there. Not one of them was one because I walked around in front of them trying to be a good Christian. Though I did try to be a good Christian, but they were one to Christ called to open this Bible and show them how to get saved. It doesn't say go into all the world and demonstrate your good lifestyle. It says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Confront them. Talk to them. Romans 1.17 does not say faith comes by observation. What does it say? It says faith cometh by hearing, not by seeing, by hearing. And hearing by what? By the Word of God. Isn't that plain? That's Romans 10, 17 in those lifestyle evangelists the Bible. What about the woman of the well? She just got saved. Been married five times when the man wasn't her husband. She'd have been baptized, capsized, or simonized. She didn't know a Presbyterian from a participle. There had been, some, uh, there'd been a big group of independent fundamental Baptist preachers in town all day long at the local steakhouse, discussing why you couldn't win folks to Christ in that town. And their chief argument was that we don't want to get them green. You say that in the Bible? Yeah. Look at John 4, 35. Jesus said to that crowd, it's been up all to eat and eat, discussing why you couldn't do it in that town. Don't say four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, the fields are ripe, not green, ripe already to harvest, and the laborers are few. The problem is not with the harvest, with the laborers. We don't have anybody to work anymore. Did you know that woman didn't know John 3.16? She'd have been to a sword conference. She never had read Dr. Howell's book on how to win souls. She never had read Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. She just ran to town. Same town where these independent fundamental Baptist preachers had been sitting by discussing why you couldn't do it there. And she didn't know you couldn't do it there. And she just said, come see a man that told me all that ever I did is not this to Christ. She didn't know one Bible verse. She even exaggerated. He didn't tell her everything she ever did. He just told she'd been married five times but a man wasn't her husband. But you can forgive her for exaggerating. She was a woman. But God overlooked her exaggeration. And you know what the Bible says? Many. In the town, what's the next word? Believe. Oh, oh, that's funny, isn't it? Believed on him because of her testimony, because of her life, because of what she said, or what she did, because of what she said. And what did they do? They believed, made Jesus Lord of the life, and got baptized, and kept the Ten Commandments, and started tithing. No, they just believed. Yeah, that's all they did. Well, they saved what the Bible says. Now, if you teach her lifestyle evangelism, she went to town grinning, trying to look like a good Christian. How many folks would have got saved? Nobody. They said, look at her. She's done got run at me. I bet she got another man. Now, look at her. She's grinning. She done run him off. Now, she done got another one. What kind of lifestyle did she have, man? Been married five times, shacked up with a man she wasn't married to. She didn't have no lifestyle. She wasn't even a church member yet because they hadn't had time to get a motion in seconds. the book. That's John chapter 4. That's in the Bible. You know what's in the Bible? You wouldn't remember. You, you, you're not going to bother about running around grinning. Jimmy Carter was born grinning. The undertaker's most difficult job when he dies is to get him close his mouth. 
They'll take ten tubes of glue to get his lips stay together. And I always tell the truth, and when I do, I go another tooth. What's the soul winning sign say in the Bible? Psalm 126, verse 6, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing cheesily. Why do we want to leave that and go to somebody else's method when this is a Bible program? You know what these comments are about? It's about getting us back to the Bible program. Just being serious with God and serious with the Bible. That's all. He that goeth, that's me. If I go and I weep, that I have compassion for sinners and love sinners, and I bear the precious seed, Luke 8, 11, said the seed, the word of God, the promise is I will, without a doubt, come again rejoicing, bring in my cheese with me. If I don't come back rejoicing, bring in cheese, then Psalm 126, 6, line. The problem is we're not going and weeping and opening this Bible because we've been told that's not the way you do it anymore. And we believe some preacher who's educated beyond common sense. I think about the worst thing that happens to preachers is education. You're awful quiet here, man. We get to educated, we, we find ourselves correcting God all the time. And nobody in God knows about it. I'm not against education. I think everybody will have a little bit. One guy said, thank God for my ignorance. Another guy said, bless him, Lord, he has a lot to be grateful for. He changed the salvation sign. You think it's too easy to tell a man Jesus died for him, trust the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I should be saved. So we won't add all this other stuff to him. He changed the separation sign, and that's legalism. Try to discourage people who finally have separated clean lives. No, it's not legalism. It shows you're ignorant. He changed the soul winning sign to the go and preach the gospel, go around and live it before him. Why don't some of these preachers who teach lifestyle evangelism teach lifestyle tithing? Why do they have these stewardship bangers and pass out these envelopes and pledge cards? Why don't they just get up before the people and every Sunday let the deacons march by with the offering plates and let him put his tithe in and grin? So the, till the congregation watches him so much, they say one Sunday, What you doing, preachers, that I'm tithing? See how many weeks you can stay in business with lifestyle tithing. You're going to have to have a stewardship banquet and tie them down and hit them over the head and do everything with them. The guy said to me the other day, I can't get enough money out of my people. How to get more money out of them? I said, you know how to get more milk out of a cow. Take her and tie her head up to a post and get you two before. Hit her across the head. Hard as you can hit her four or five times. What? God bless you, Bessie. You give more if you try. You're holding out. God bless you. You don't need to keep all that milk. You can't drink it. What? Hit her again. There ain't no way to get more milk out of a cow. The only way to get more milk out of a cow is feed her some good alfalfa hay and some sweet feed. Just pour it to her. She'll come trotting home with all four faucets running wide open. You have to get a bucket to get under in a hurry. You'll miss some of it. I'm telling you the truth. We used to have a cow like that. We had to chase her home with a bucket. She spilled half of it on the way home. I tried to put new uh, washers in her faucets, but I couldn't find a place to take them off. And you know what? If you'll pet old Bessie across the back and say, God bless you, Bessie, you're the best cow in Texas. Be sweet till she'll sleep on her back so the cream will be on the top in the morning. But if you really want more milk and a dairy, go buy you 50 more cows. If you really want more money in the offer plate, go win your 50 more sinners to Jesus and get them down the aisle. If that ain't enough money, go eat your 50 more and get them down the aisle and teach them how to tithe. You, you, you might win a cow out there that gives several gallons a day. Well, in my case, most of my cows gave a cup full. But I tagged on to one or two to give a bucket full every once in a while. 
Huh? Sound about so when he's been king. Don't you teach lifestyle baptism? So tell a man he ought to get. Don't confront him and say you ought to be baptized now since you're saved. Just let one of the deacons baptize you every Sunday. You just you just demonstrate through your lifestyle that he ought to do something. And after a while, when they baptize you so much, you look so you look like a prune. Maybe somebody run up there and say, "What are you doing?" You said, "I'm getting baptized." Could I get baptized? Well, you said, "If you want to, if you beg me. We'll let you get baptized." That's dumb, ain't it? You know why you teach lifestyle evangelism? Why people teach they're just lazy and don't want to work and don't want to go see people because the hardest work in the ministry is knocking on doors and trying to get people to get saved. That's the hardest work. It's easy to go to the platform and preach like I'm doing right there because you like to hear the amens that I'm enjoying. And you like to have people pat you on the back and say, it's a good sermon, I enjoy it. But when you want a soul to Christ out there at the bus stop or on the back alley and some poor little shack, nobody's going to pat you on the back and brag on your back there. But heaven looks down and sees you and that little fellow to Christ over there. And they have old-fashioned Nazarene Pentecostal Baptist slobbing, running, and and kick up gold dust up in heaven and shout when you get somebody saved. Let's change that soul when he's signed back. What do you say? These dirty crooks gone through the countryside changing the signs on us. No wonder we're going every direction. Let's change it back to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Let's change it back. That he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall lives come again to rejoice and bring in cheese. Let's change it back. And when they say lifestyle, you say, oh, no, no. Faith comes by hearing, not by observation. Was John the Baptist a lifestyle evangelist? He was a witness, a witness, a witness. Keep reading John chapter 1, see how he witnessed. Down in verse 23, he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He didn't say, I'm the life of one demonstrating in the wilderness. Let's take it like it says it. I'm the voice of one. You know what? I am the voice of one. You know what? David Bowley's the voice of one. You know what? Brother Randy Ray's the voice of one. Gary Coleman's the voice of one. Larry Norrell's the voice of one. Dear Brother Pringle's the voice of one. You're the voice of one. Everybody here's the voice of one. That's all you, the voice of one. And you know what you ought to be doing? Crying in the wilderness. You know what you ought to be crying? Jump down six verses and see what John cries in verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Behold him means look at him, trust him, depend on him. Look to him. I don't know what it is. We think we ought to change. Everything else changed. You know, they changed ties. I threw away my wife and I, this week. I went through my closet. I, we must have took out, I don't think I'm exactly when I say four or five hundred times. I didn't count them. I never seen too many times. They're wild enough. You can make a quilt out of three of them. Sir, well, I dropped food on. I told her to put them in the refrigerator. We'd we'll make some soup out of them. Don't know what kind of soup it'd be, but we could name it some kind of new name and sell it. Can it? Style scene. Car scene. Price of gasoline changes. So we feel Lord changes the church program. Everything else changes. No, let's stay with it. Malachi 3, 6, God said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Israel. James chapter 1, all good and perfect gifts comes down to the Father above, in whom there is no variableness. You ought to say that slow to yourself sometimes. In whom there is no variableness. He never varies in one hour. Neither shadow of turning. What a statement. Let's get back to the old book. What do you say? Let's get back to being salvation by grace. Let, let's get back to saying separation is one thing, legalism is another thing. Don't get them confused. Let's get back to going to soul winning like the Bible says instead of, instead of following all this lifestyle stuff. I believe in living a good life. And it backs up your testimony and people will listen to you better if you live it yourself. But you can't live it long to get anybody saved because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to tell them how to get saved. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, not by the foolishness of observation. Need I keep driving that point home? Because I got another sign I want to change here before I quit. Because oh, the Pentecost is about ruining this sign. It's the Spirit filled life sign. And most Baptists have heard so much erroneous teaching about the Spirit filled life. That they, if anybody says spirit filled, they jump about two miles. Scares them to death. 
But the Holy Spirit's the best friend you ever had. He's your constant companion. You're out of business without him. But what happens? PTL Cubs comes along. Don't get mad, Pentecostal friends, and lose your religion. Tammy comes along, Jim. They put up a new sign, grin, and say the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's not in the Bible. That's not even in the PTO Club Bible. Don't leave me now. Don't leave me. And so we, we've seen such a mess made out of it, we don't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit at all. Not but one church in the Bible spoke in tongues, the church at Corinth. And it was not a spiritual church, it was a carnal church. First Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul said, Brother, I cannot speak unto you as under spiritual, but as under carnal, you as under babes. I fed you with milk, not with meat, because hitherto up and now you not, were not able to bear it, neither yet now you're able. For you're carnal and walk as men, wherein there's strife and division among you. One said unto Paul, one said unto Apollos. What's all, what's all about? They're carnal, they're fleshly. Keep reading the book of First Corinthians. You'll find them committing adultery with their own stepmothers. You'll find them taking you out of the court. You'll find them eating meat sacrificed to idols. You'll find the women running the church in chapter 14. And he says, the women keep silent in the church. You take the one out of the tongue, move to die tomorrow. I guess I made a lot of enemies tonight, but I'm having the most fun. Nowhere does the Bible say when you feel the Holy Ghost you'll speak in tongues. That's not in anybody's Bible unless they wrote it in there. Luke chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, speaking of John the Baptist, says, He shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall neither drink wine nor strong drink, but shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. If you've got to talk in tongues as an evidence, can you visualize John being born before they cut the unbiblical cord? He said, oh, they said, he's got it, he's got it, glory to God, he's got it. Can you visualize such a thing? He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. I didn't write it, I'm just saying what it says. You don't like it, tear it down to the God, you don't like it. That's what it says in Luke one fifteen. The kid couldn't talk till he was a year old, let alone in tongues. I got a boy who can't speak English yet. He speaks hillbilly. Was and getting fixing y'all about to and all that stuff. If he ever masters that tongue, I'll be happy. Let alone another tongue. But they say it's our prayer language. You know, we talk to God in this language. And I and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be good if God knew English? You wouldn't, have to sound, you wouldn't have to sound like a turkey gobbler when you talk to him. You could just talk in English. He could understand. Wouldn't it be nice? I know your verse. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. He that speaks in unknown tongues speaks not unto men, but unto God. But you stop in the middle of the verse. You didn't finish it. The rest of the verse says, How be it no man understandeth him. The Bible does not say the unknown tongue. That's not in anybody's Bible. It says an unknown tongue. These are definite articles. You know, I knew that, did you, man? And means any tongue you don't know. The means some specific tongue. But an unknown tongue means any tongue you don't know. If you don't know Chinese, that's an unknown tongue to you. If you don't know Hebrew, it's an unknown tongue to you. All tongues except English and hillbilly is unknown to me. So when it says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. You know, they should have get that messed up good. Did you ever did you ever sit down in a restaurant and hear people in the booth next to you speaking in another language? I don't know. And and you, you you know you look over and they look towards you and I and you and you think they're looking at me, they're talking about me. I wish I knew what they were saying. And you say, Oh, well, I just knew what they were saying. They're speaking an unknown tongue to you. Why? Because it says, How be it no man understanding. Of course if it was an unknown tongue, you couldn't understand it. If you understood it wouldn't be unknown. Isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? And I didn't go to college. Isn't that simple? He that speaks unknown tongues speaks not unto men but unto God. Oh, well, why is he speaking to God then? 
Because there's no tongue, God doesn't know. You can't get in a corner and talk in Chinese and think God's not listening. Because He knows Chinese too. And you can't get in the corner and talk in Hebrew and think God's not He knows Hebrew too. You can't speak in any language God don't know. He listens on all conversations. He knows all languages. But you can get in the middle of this building and start speaking in Russian. Nobody knows what in the world you're saying, but God knows everything you're saying. So if you spoke in an unknown tongue, you'd be speaking unto men because we don't know what it was. But you wouldn't speak to God because He knows Russian. And they took that verse and made a prayer language out of it. And they really think they talk like that God hears them better. Sad, really. They changed the Spirit-filled sign and said, you get Spirit-filled and the evidence speaking in tongues. You know. Everybody that's saved ought to be Spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. But when John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost, he never spoke in tongues. Not even after he was one year old, two years old, he never spoke in tongues in his whole life. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Oh. But I tell you what he did do. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither drink wine nor strong drink, but shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Next verse. And he shall know. And he shall speak in tongues no more. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. If there's an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's having a burden for souls and winning more souls to Christ. Because the Holy Spirit's whole mission in the world is to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. The Holy Spirit's mission in the world is to draw sinners to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's mission in the world is to save people. It's a spiritual birth. You can't be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. And I've talked to some precious Pentecostal people and and explained these verses, and I, I had one man say to me, I don't care what the Bible says. You're not going to talk me out of my experience. And I said, wow. Wow. Well, if your experience doesn't harmonize with the Bible, you better jump your experience to get to the Bible. I may as well say this because I haven't made enemies anyway. But the tongues movement is doing more to bring together the one world church for the Antichrist than anything I know of. Because you have Mormons and Catholics and Baptists and Lutherans and everything all in one big hodgepodge. And the basis of fellowship is they've all had the same experience. They don't care what they believe. How in the world can you put your arm around a Roman Catholic priest who believes in salvation by the seven sacraments and thinks that the man over in Rome is infallible? They dress him like Mama and call him Papa. Come on. And let a cat who believes in mortal and venial sins and purgatory and limbo. Limbo is a place where unbaptized infants go, just in case you didn't get baptized. That's where the Church of Christ got baptized in the regeneration of the Catholics. Well, you got it too. You got it. Stay with me. I just threw that in. Didn't have, that's, this is all my notes right here. Didn't have no I don't even need them. Well, I'm through with them. Yeah. You, they get together with Catholics, believe in baptism and regeneration. Think that a little baby dies before he gets baptized, he goes to limbo because he hasn't been baptized, he can't go to heaven. So when they baptize him, he saves him, he gives him the spiritual birth, so he calls him Papa or Father the rest of his life because he's a spiritual father. That's why the Bible said, call no man Father. And only one Father, the Father in heaven. Kind of quiet in here. You say you're mad at everybody, just about everybody. I'm getting mad at the rest of them. You know why I'm mad? Because oh, people have been changing the signs. And they got the world confused. Oh, let's leave the signs like that. You know why the German soldier had a major success at the Battle of the Bulge? Because somebody got behind the lines and just went around changing the signs. I can't speak on the rest of these signs have been changed. But I wish I could. There's more of them. The fundamental signs change. We've got a total new definition of fundamentalism. So that now includes evangelical. Don't leave me. Dr. John R. Rath was a member of the National Association of Evangelicals, the NAE. 
and he left it because they wouldn't take a strong stand on separation and believe in ecumenical evangelism, putting Catholics and Mormons and everything together. An evangelistic effort to get people saved, claiming that the end justifies the means. Dr. Rice said that ain't right, and he stood up against it and fought it in the early 50s and 60s. He lost thousands of descriptions over it, but thank God he didn't count any loss. He knew what was right, and he said what was right. If evangelicalism was bad when Dr. Rice pulled out of it, it's worse now. We've changed the fundamentalist sign, and we use the word evangelical and fundamentalist synonymous. They're two different words. An evangelical may believe in all the fundamentals of the faith, but he doesn't believe in ecclesiastical separation. Billy Graham believes in all the fundamentals of the faith. But he doesn't practice ecclesiastical separation. You're getting quiet in here now. Yeah. Well, he yokes up with unbelievers. He puts his arm around a Catholic priest and calls him this dear Christian brother when he knows if he believes the Bible that he's not saved. That he's trusting the seven sacraments. He hasn't got the last rites yet and may not get them. If he misses one sacrament, he's going to be in bad shape. He's going to get all seven funnels. He calls him a Christian brother. He's not trusting Jesus. He's trusting the Catholic Church. Trusting his baptism. Christian brother. Now then, Francis Schaeffer writes a book on the great evangelical disaster. He's right. It is a disaster. But he, ne- but he never told what caused the disaster. The disaster is, he says, some of our young evangelicals are denying the virgin birth. Some of our young evangelicals are now denying the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Poor fellow couldn't see why they did it. I'm not fussing that he couldn't see why they did it. What happened? They yoked up with people that spit on the Bible and laughed at the virgin birth and, and, and raised these young evangelicals around people that spit on the Bible. And they, they found out these guys that didn't believe the Bible were... We're nice fellows. They weren't mean like I am. Come on. And they fell in love with these guys. And then he gave an intellectual argument as to why Jesus could not have possibly been virgin born. It's a bi- biological impossibility. And he raised him around these turkeys. And these turkeys then taught him to believe the Bible is not the Word of God. And now they're, now they're decrying the great evangelical disaster and they don't know they created it. Because first generation new evangelicals joking up with unbelievers produced a second generation of new evangelicals who became unbelievers. You don't put a well man in the hospital room with a sick man to get the sick man well. If you put a well man and a sick man in the hospital room, it doesn't equal two well men but two sick men. You don't put a skunk in the living room with a bottle of perfume to, to make the skunk feel smell better. The result will be the perfume will smell worse. You don't level up, you level down. We may be brought in our base, but we're sure getting a lot more shallower every time we get brought or we get more shallow. The fundamentalist, somebody believes the Bible is the Word of God, believes in the fundamentals of faith, and he believes in ecclesiastical separation. He does not yoke up with unbelievers knowingly. He does not call a man that spits on the virgin birth a Christian brother. Kind of quiet. Well, I threw my signs away, but the signs are being changed. Every one of these points deserves a well-developed sermon that's taught, and I've just quoted Scripture by memory. I haven't been able to give it to you. There's so many signs being changed, but I thought somebody ought to say something about it. I thought somebody ought to say, hey, tell folks you're saved by grace through faith again. I think somebody ought to say, hey, it's hard to be separated and live right. You're not a legalist because you... Won't live clean, right? I thought somebody would say, hey, the way to get real churches is to go back to soul winning, go and tell folks how to get saved when folks are Christ. I'm not mad at anybody. But I do love God and I do love this book and I love what's right. And I think President Reagan has been quoting Edmund Burke for the last week. He's quoted him five or six times. You watch the president on television. One of the famous quotes he used this week over and over again. Is all that's necessary for bad men to succeed is for good men to do nothing. And while these people change all the signs, and we know they're changing, we know it's wrong, but we just sit by and let them change and don't ever say anything. I don't know what the next generation of young people is going to do. If somebody don't talk about sowing it again and preach the gospel clear again, 
And that's what these conferences are all about. Yeah. What do you say we just, every time we see a sign change, and we hear some turkey get up and change it. Wait, wait, that's the wrong sign. Turn it back around. The way to heaven is not works in baptism. Even to, The way to heaven is by grace, through faith. Put that back on there. Take that other junk off the sign. Change the sign around again. <laughs>